I didn't mention this last week for time's sake, and really I wanted to kind of introduce it at the beginning of this week. But at the end of chapter three, we learn that there is another man who, according to Hebrew custom, has prior claim to Mary Ruth. The righteous Boaz, he won't proceed without giving this man his lawful opportunity. So chapter three, like chapter two, ends in suspense. And so with this, we come this morning to chapter four. Let us read the text together. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. And Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the the gate of this native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the, woman, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. May it go out this day, accomplishing all that you purpose it to do. And we will be careful to give you all honor and glory. In Christ we pray, amen. So we come to chapter four. After the midnight meeting in chapter three, we notice that in chapter four, it begins with Boaz going to the city gate where official business is done to resolve this matter of chapter three. 
You know the story as we just read it. The nearer kinsman comes by, and Boaz lays the situation out before him. Naomi is willing to give up all the property she has, and it is the duty of the nearer kinsman to buy it so that the inheritance stays in the family. The book of Ruth is storytelling at its finest. We as readers, are we not, completely invested at this point. We want to see the story through. And it is to our dismay that we read the kinsman says at the end of verse four, I will redeem it. Because we don't want him to redeem it, do we? We want Boaz to do it. So again, there's a setback in the story. And the irony here of this setback, it has been caused by righteousness. This man, of whom is never named in the story of Ruth, is only doing his duty. But just when we are about to say, stop, stop the story. Don't let this other man take Ruth. Boaz tells the rest of the story, as it were. And he says in verse five, to the nearer kinsman, he says this, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in the inheritance. It was one thing to redeem land, right? Now this man is being told, uh, oh, by the way, you have to take the Moabite, the foreigner, with the land. And so it's at this point that, to our great relief at least, the kinsman says in verse 6 that he can't do it. The text doesn't tell us why. Perhaps he's married. We don't know. Whatever the reason, Boaz is now free to marry Ruth. And so with this, the elders of the city pronounce a blessing upon Boaz in verses 11 and 12. This blessing, as we read through it, is pretty amazing because it, it, it could have been a blessing that was conventional at that time, pronounced upon married couples in Bethlehem. We don't know for sure. But this particular blessing has even more significance for Ruth and Boaz. Because if you go back to chapter 1, We are told in chapter 1 that Ruth and Malon were married for 10 years before Malon dies. The author here is, that's not a throwaway line. Because in that day, to be married for 10 years with no child means that something is wrong. They weren't waiting, enjoying their honeymoon phase together, as we often do in this day and age. No, no. You married to have children to perpetuate the line. And so 10 years had gone by and Ruth was unable to bear a son for Malon. Think about that for a moment. Had she been able to conceive and bear a son for Malon, we would never know the story of Ruth. But now, through the Lord's intervention, she is conceiving and bearing a son For Boaz, we see in verse 13. Notice what the scripture says in verse 13. The Lord gave her conception. This is only the second time in the book of Ruth that the Lord, that God has been front and center. We talked about that that God is sovereign, that God is providentially working in the book of Ruth, and he is. And we've seen that throughout. But he's working behind the scenes for the most part. This is only the second time in the book of Ruth that he's mentioned front and center, that he actually is the subject of the verb, that he is actually doing something. The other time was in chapter 1, verse 6, where it says that the Lord broke the famine, that God acted and gave his people food once again. Here, at the end of the book, just like the beginning of the book, God is acting to bring redemption for his people. But this son that's mentioned, you noticed in the text, this son was not simply for Boaz and Ruth. He would provide a comfort and joy for Naomi also. 
Remember back as we retrace the story here at the beginning of the sermon, all that Naomi has been through. And Naomi is getting up there in age. And as she ages, as the women of the city pronounce a blessing upon her, they are letting her know that this kinsman redeemer and his son would provide for her needs in her declining years. So the women of the city say this in verses 14 and 15 as they bless her. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Considering all that Naomi has been through, the text goes on to say in a very touching scene this, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The grandson on Naomi's lap was a clear sign that the emptiness that she had felt in the beginning has now been replaced by fullness because of God's grace. Even though no one could bring back her husband, no one could bring back her sons, now she had a daughter-in-law whom, not necessarily for the first time, but I think as the text has progressed, Naomi and even the women of the city start to recognize as someone special. Did you notice in the blessing what they called Ruth, what they said of her, that she is more than seven sons? That is an amazing compliment in this ancient culture. She has a redeemer, Naomi does, in Boaz. And even more than that, she has a descendant to carry on the family line. Still, a husband and a son are not the only issues that are being resolved here in this final scene. We have one more plot twist that has sprang upon us at the very end of the book. You see, this story is not just about God supplying for the needs of certain individuals. No. God in the process here is also paving the way for a king. This is not just a story about God's covenant faithfulness, his hesed. You remember that word that really goes throughout the book of Ruth? It's, it's not just about his covenant faithfulness to Naomi and Ruth. It's about his covenant faithfulness to Israel, his people. If you go back to the very first verse of the book, we're given a setting, and I told you in week one that that's not just a time and place. It's not just a historical setting. It's really a theological setting. This story, the book of Ruth, happens when the judges ruled. You remember that time, don't you? A time of chaos. A time when, as the last verse of the book says, a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so at the, according to the very first verse of the book of Ruth, the Israelites are still in the days of the judges. They haven't even thought about asking for a king yet. However, in his sovereignty and covenant faithfulness, God was already preparing ahead of time the line of the one who would ultimately meet that need. Who would have guessed as this story began that this is how it would end. Think about it. If the story of Ruth had just ended in a little Judean village with an old grandmother hugging a new grandson, it would be a nice story. But it, we would not be reading it today, much less preaching a series through it. But the author doesn't leave it there, does he? Here at the end of the book, we discover that God has in all of this, been pursuing much bigger plans than bringing two worthy individuals together. What looked like a simple story 
of God meeting the personal needs of these two women turns out to be God's way of meeting a far greater need. The story that opened in the days when the judges ruled closes with the genealogy of Israel's most famous king. This genealogy links this story, the story of Ruth, with the line that would build the house of Israel more than any other line since the time of Jacob, the line of David. God used all of these events to bring about something much bigger than the story of Ruth. Something much greater is going on here. Something much more than any of the characters in the story could have ever imagined living their lives as they were. The elder's blessing to Boaz at the gate of the city, it, long, it, it was fulfilled long after his death. And we see that as it was forward-looking, not just backward-looking. Ian Duguid, in his comment, a commentary, notices this. The elder's blessing look backward as well as forward. The themes of blessing, name, offspring, and the building of a house of Israel resonate deeply in the history of God's people. These themes go all the way back, he notices, to God's promise to Abraham and a great name and a great nation that would come from his offspring so that all the peoples of the earth would find a blessing for themselves in him. That's it. Ruth herself an individual Gentile convert is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. At the same time, however, this genealogy shows us that she has a bigger part to play as an ancestor of King David. David is not just a great king. He's not just an answer to the problem of anarchy in the days of the judges. But he's also a fulfillment to the promise made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But before we move on, because we all know where the line of David is heading, but before we do that, notice, and, and, and I get it, when we're reading genealogies in Scripture, there are often not the most interesting parts of the text, are they? Oftentimes they're filled with names we can't pronounce. They're people we don't know. We think they have no significance to what we're doing and what we're reading. But I beg to differ because as we look at these genealogies, we again see the sovereign providential hand of God orchestrating events and people's lives in such a way that they may stay barren for 10 years only to marry into the family of Boaz to carry on the line of David. Perhaps the most striking aspect of this genealogy, and really the blessing, goes back to the blessing by the elders of the city on Boaz and Ruth, is the analogy that's drawn in verse 12 between Ruth and Tamar. Did you notice this? Look at verse 12. The, the conclusion of the blessing that the elders give to Boaz and to Ruth, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. You remember Judah, the son of Jacob, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. He was the son through whom the line of David and ultimately the line of Christ would travel. But notice who's mentioned here. The son that that line would go through is Perez. His mother was Tamar. Tamar's story is recording in Genesis, recorded in Genesis chapter 38. Like Ruth, Tamar was an outsider to God's covenant people. She married into the families under both of them actually did under what we would probably call interesting circumstances. She too lost her husband. She too had no child. 
Both Ruth and Tamar dressed themselves up in pursuit of a child and a future. But here's where the similarities between the two ends. Because Ruth revealed her identity to Boaz and received a child legitimately through marriage. Whereas Tamar, if you remember the story, concealed her identity, deceived Judah in order to receive a child outside of marriage. In fact, if you read the story in Genesis 38, Tamar pretended to be a prostitute in order to trap her father-in-law, Judah, into sleeping with her so that she might have a child. Sordid tale, as it were. But the text here makes the link between these two women. The end result of both of these unions, both legitimate and illegitimate, was children who in the providence of God had an important part to play in God's plan. Why does God work this way? Why does God act this way? Would we have chosen Tamar as one to continue the line of David, the line of Christ? Why is he willing to be involved with such an assortment of characters? If you go to the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, you see four women, five if you include Mary there, but you see four women mentioned in this genealogy of Jesus. Front and center, there's Tamar, the Canaanite mother of Perez and Zerah, who we just spoke about. Also, there's another woman listed there. Do you recall who the mother of Boaz is? It was Rahab. Rahab didn't just dress up as a prostitute. She really was one. In another incredible story of redemption, Rahab, the pagan prostitute, was granted faith in the Lord and was spared in the destruction of Jericho. We know from the story in Joshua that along with her family, she came in to the people of Israel. She found a place in the ancestry of our Lord because she was brought into the covenant community. Amazing story. Next, there was Ruth, who for all her worthiness, as we've seen in this text, she was still a Moabitess. She was a despised foreigner by the people of God. Finally, there was Bathsheba. We know the story of Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, the former wife of Uriah. This is quite a family tree, is it not? But, but just so we're not picking on the women, the men in the family tree aren't any better. Think about it. After all, it was Judah who slept with Tamar, all the time thinking she was a prostitute. It was David who seduced Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed. Furthermore, in the list of ancestors of Jesus is Manasseh, the greatest idolater among all the kings of Israel. Manasseh is the one whose sins were so great that from that time on, from his reign on, the exile of God's people was a foregone conclusion. Together, it's these men and women who make up the lineage of the king, the greatest king in Israel, David, and also the son of God. Why would God choose for his son to be descended from a line like this, tainted as it were. Well, I think Matthew actually explains that if you read on in chapter one from the genealogy. And if you will, take, take your Bibles just a moment. You probably all know the verse. But right on the heels of the genealogy in Matthew chapter one, we find beginning in verse 18, the story of the birth of Jesus. We find here where the angel came to Joseph who had found out that Mary was pregnant. And the angel, of course, comes to Joseph and tells him not to put Mary away because the angel says to Joseph in verse 21, she, she being Mary, will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people 
from their sins. As Jesus himself puts it in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to rescue sinners. People just like his own ancestors. People just like you and me. When he came to seek and save that which was lost, he came into this world not separated from sinners, but descended from a long line of them. During his lifetime, he would surround himself with sinners, so much so that the way in which he was known in his day by the people around him was that he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was referred to that many times. He even died among sinners, being hung between two thieves on the cross. Why? Why would the Lord of the universe choose to expose himself to such pain, such humiliation, to wrap himself in a family line such as this, to surround himself with tax collectors and sinners? Well, the answer is quite clear. It's the way in which he would save them. It's the way in which he would save us. He could not save sinners by say, staying a safe distance from them, but only by coming alongside us, becoming one of us, identifying with us. He had to become the friend of sinners. And ultimately, as the scripture tells us, he would provide for us the greatest act of friendship, John tells us, is to lay down your life for them. Jesus gave up his life. No one took it from him, he says, but he gave it up. He went down into death so that he might pay the price for our sins. Again, quoting Ian Dugwood, our sins have paid our admission price into eternal separation from God. In one word, hell. Another way to think of it, he says, is that we with the wages of our sin, have purchased a ticket to hell. What Jesus did on the cross was to take that ticket right out of our hands. Instead, he gave us the ticket that he had earned by his righteous life, a ticket that would admit the bearer into God's presence. He switched places with us, going where we deserve to go while sending us to the destination he had merited. You see, the love of Jesus is far greater than the love of Ruth or Naomi or even Boaz. He left heaven. He left intimate fellowship with his father to come into this fallen, sinful world. He didn't merely just risk his reputation for us. He became, Isaiah tells us, of no reputation, despised and rejected by men. At the moment of his greatest pain, at the moment of his greatest rejection on the cross, there was no redeemer to come and rescue him like Boaz. There was only darkness. There was only separation from God the Father. And he even yells out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the length that Christ was willing to go for sinners such as his ancestors and sinners such as you and me. Ruth is a wonderful parable of God's covenant love, of God's covenant faithfulness to his people. But in the book of Ruth, Jesus is the redeemer behind the human redeemer. Boaz is just a pointer. He's pointing us to Christ. And if we miss that, if we read the story of Ruth through human lenses and say it's a great story, it's a wonderful love story, these two young people coming together, having a child, then we miss the point. The point of the story was always to point us to Christ. This is also, though, and don't miss this, what God has done in the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, he's done for us as well. 
He's the redeemer behind each and every one of our personal salvation stories. He sought each of us while we were sinners, completely lost, separated from him. And not only does he make us feel valuable, he makes us valuable. It's not just Ruth's story that turns out to be part of a bigger story, even bigger than she could ever imagined. Your story, my story, is woven into God's big story, just like theirs. Now, granted, our story may not be read and preached on 3,000 years from now. I get that. I understand that. Nevertheless, the New Testament tells us that Christ has seated us with him in the heavenly realms, exalted us along with him to the glories of heaven. He has made us co-heirs with him and blessed us, Paul says in Ephesians, with every spiritual blessing. In him, we have been given a glorious genealogy. We are, Paul reminds us in Romans 8, children of God. And though we in our own sin, much like Naomi, wander away empty, sometimes we even become bitter towards him. He has brought us back full indeed. Do you have the eyes of faith to see that? Do we, like Naomi, sometimes become so inwardly focused that we cannot see past our own lives? We cannot see um, what God is doing in the grand scheme of things through us. Have we become bitter toward him? He's writing your story even now, much like their story. If you are a child of God, your story is secure. And we know how the story ends. Yes, we may not know all the details here on earth. We may not know how long we're going to live. We may not know what the future holds necessarily in this life. But we know the end. We know we're his. And we know one day we will spend eternity with him forever in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the story of Ruth. It is a beautiful story. It is a wonderful story. But it is a story about you, your love, your grace, your covenant faithfulness to your people of whom we are a part. Just like Ruth, just like Naomi, just like Boaz, you are writing our story for our good and for your glory. Father, take our eyes off ourselves. Place them on you through Christ so that we may see, Father, that there is no reason ultimately to be bitter. Yes, we don't know what's going on and we don't know why things are happening a certain way in our lives right now, but you do and you are providentially working, that the outcome will be exactly what you want it to be. Give us the eyes of faith to see. Help us, as Paul reminds us, to walk by that faith and not by sight. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. 